Uh, I'm Christy Leslie. I'm a member of the um, ILA Marketing Forum Board. Um, so welcome. I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, we are talking today about how to welcome patrons back into the library in the time of COVID. Um, I have a welcome campaign that I'm going to share. Um, I didn't know if anybody had anything to start with to dive in, or I can just hop into those emails. Um, feel free to throw any questions in the chat. Um, and then after that, I'd love to hear what other people are working on, what they're excited about. Um, forgive me, I have two screens. So sometimes I turn, you get this lovely view of the side of my face as I turn to look at both screens. Um, so um, let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so just to share a little bit of background before I dive in, um, I'm from Helen Plum Library in Lombard, um, and I'm the marketing manager there. I've been there for um, going on seven years now. Um, and we rebranded and launched our rebrand um, in the beginning of 2021, because um, I think we just figured didn't have enough going on. So we decided to rebrand. We're actually uh, building a new building. So it kind of tied in with that. Um, which has been a crazy time to build a new building as well. But um, we, after the rebrand, we launched, um, we signed on with Patron Point in July of, of last year. And um, one of the things that Patron Point offers is the online card registration, which is called Verify for them. Um, so to tie in with that, we launched this welcome campaign. And um, we wanted to make sure if people are registering online, they might not actually make it into the building um, for a good amount of time. So we wanted to kind of get information into their hands about everything we offer, because I'm sure you guys all know there's so much and there's so much that people don't know about. Um, so what you can see on my screen right now is what's called a campaign and patron point, but it's basically the sequence of emails and how, how the, um, like the flow works for the email campaign. Um, and so I just wanted to show you this before I dive into the emails so it makes sense a little bit how um, people are receiving these over time. Um, so it's it's a, a sequence of five emails per person um, and it diverges at the age group so they get a different email depending on what age they are. Um, so we start with a quick start guide because we're hoping that if they read nothing else, they at least see this first email and um, have a chance to get sort of an overview of the library. Um, and then we focus on books, movies, and more. We focus on our website and the third email. And then it goes to um, department-based emails talking about youth services, teen, adult, or senior. Um, and the last one is sort of a sign off for our social media and just kind of stay connected with us. Here's how you can keep in touch. Um, so that's sort of the overview. And with that being said, I'm just going to um, show off what they actually look like. Um, I'll just check in the chat over here. Um, so this is the first email. It's what we're calling our quick start guide. Um, I have an amazing graphic designer who uh, worked on the graphics for this. Um, and so each email starts with our header and links that a lot of people might want to get to the catalog right away, get to the website right away or see our events. Um, and that's consistent across the emails. Um, and then moving on, we just kind of have an overview of what the library offers, like all of our services and sort of the high level categories. Um, and then it goes down to our social media. So that's number one. And if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to chime in and stop me. I don't wanna go too fast. Um, the second one is books, movies, and more. And this kind of dives into the materials that we offer and some of our um, reader's advisory and what we what happens if you can't find it, if we, if we need to send people to an ILL sort of situation or we have book match and things like that. Um, so that's number two. Sorry, Zoom is hiding my tabs here. Um, number three, lets people know what's offered digitally online at the library. Um, kind of parses it out into the, the resources, the e-media, and then um, 
what's available in the building online um, as far as public computers and things like that. And then we dive into our, our age-based emails. Um, so, sorry, I just want to mention that this is a really um, unrelated moment, but our graphic designer actually rebranded based on a petal shape that's in our logo. So we had, we've started to kind of pop that in and it's just a really cute little touch. Um, but we worked with our the managers for each department to pull in content that was relevant um, and that they really wanted to highlight, especially right now. Our plan is to kind of review these quarterly after we get launched, um, after we've been launched for a while. Um, so that is our youth email. This is teens. It talks about our, our TAP group, um, which is our teen advisory board, and then sort of tying in creative bug and, and study space at the library, really trying to focus on content that we hope is really relevant to that age group. Um, our, the, this um, adults, we split, we split into um, 18 to 55 years old. And thank you, Sasha, I saw your comment. Um, and 55 and up for seniors. And so this is 18 to 55 for our, our main adult group. Um, uh, somebody asked if customers are self-selecting for the different age groups. So um, no. So when they register for a library card, they uh, put in their birthday. And so we divvied up the age groups with manager feedback. So. Um, youth is uh, zero to 12, and then 13 to um, 17 is our teen group, and then 18 to 55 is our main adult group, and then 55, and, or sorry, 54, I should say, 18 to 54, and then 55 and up is our senior group. Um, and so hopefully that answers the Amber question as well. How do you determine who is youth and teen? And that's really based on how we uh, approach programming at our library. That's how they divvy up their age groups as well. Um, so we've related it all to that. I hope that answers that question. Um, and so this is, this is our adult email. And we kind of tied in um, relevant information. And then the final one, it looks like a second adult email, but we didn't want to say, hey, seniors, because we know that that can be a sensitive label for some um, and didn't want to offend anyone uh, unintentionally um, or intentionally, I suppose, I suppose. No offense necessary. Um, so this is our senior group and we kind of um, keyed into our genealogy is much more popular in our community for the seniors. Um, home delivery is available for that group. Um, the Medigap kind of help with that. Um, so yeah, so that, and then that is the last of the age group emails. And then the last one just kind of closes out with, um, we want to hear from you, let us know what your email preferences are, um, and kind of let us keep in touch on social media, things like that. So, um, so yeah. That's, I don't know if anyone has any other questions, but they go out, um, going back to that campaign, they go out weekly. There's there's one weird gap because of how the system works. Um, but so far we've got um, some pretty good open rates. It's only a couple of weeks into the actually launching. Um, and we've got between 63 and 77% open rates, which um, we're pretty excited, we're excited about. about. So we'll so see how it keeps going, but um, yeah, that's all I have to share. So if anyone has any questions, I would love to answer them or about or patron about point. I know that's been a kind of a commentary, commentary on, on, uh, on the Facebook group lately too. Um, but if anyone else has anything uh, that they're excited to be working on or anything that's kind of a, a big question for them at the moment in their department, um, let's talk, let's hear it. Hi, Christy. Um, so I just had a question about your open rates. Have you noticed like as the campaign goes on, you get less opens or are they staying pretty consistent? How's it looking for you? Um, it's actually, it's funny because the first one, um, we're, this is very early. I will, I will give that caveat. This, we're only a couple of weeks in. So some people, the, the final email hasn't even gone out yet. Okay. Um, 
So the it actually went up from the first to the second one so far, but people are have only really dove into the beginning um, of the sequence. So we'll see how it goes. I'll keep you guys updated. Hi, Christy. It's Shandy at Illinois Heartland Library System. So we, um, I have created a um, a welcome email that automatically gets sent when someone is added to our mailing list. And that has, um, I've seen a lot of success with that because we've had a lot fewer unsubscribes. We're a little different since we've reached out to librarians, but also our trustees. And um, I'm about ready. I'm about to the point where I'm going to have time to focus on doing some more of those um, additional uh, drip campaign type emails. Would you mind sharing your uh, your organization chart for that again? I'd love to get a screenshot of that because I think that's gonna. I might just model mine off of that idea. You're muted, Christy. You're muted. I'm so sorry. Um, the answer is yes. I'm happy to do. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm happy to share a screenshot, or if any, if you want me to just put it back up on the screen, you can grab one right now. Um, that might be the easiest. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Is that up for you? Awesome. Thank you. I super appreciate that. Of course. I'll leave it up for just another second in case anybody needs it. I don't want to drop it down and put it back up again. So is anybody else working on anything exciting? I know summer reading is, has been a big topic at our library lately. Um, and kind of the mask situation, <laughs> whatever whatever we want to call it. Um, what else is going on? I, is anybody doing anything exciting with welcoming patrons back? I know one of the things we talked about recently was do, do we want to or do we want to encourage them to be back right now? Is that do we are we just happy with how things are going and working towards the spring? Um, give me all the details, folks. Hi, this is Linda at Northbrook Public Library. Um, we've had a lot of discussions about our summer reading kickoff. Last year, we did a drive-through, which was sort of um, successful. But so this year, we're hoping to do an in-person outside in the parking lot that is going to be a lot more like our past kickoffs, except for no bounce house. So trying to still maintain some social distancing and then also you know, inviting people into the library afterwards, but not having any actual programming events going on in the library for summer reading. So kind of a blended approach. Oh, that sounds great, Linda. So are you are you doing any communications relating to that where, where you're kind of tying in, you, you don't have to come inside, like this is a safe, um, do, do you know what I'm trying to get at? Like, how are you talking about that event and how it's different or, more similar to previous times? I think we're tackling that even sooner with just our in-person programming. We've started doing in-person, well, we will be starting in March to be doing in-person story times at the library. And so we're trying to still maintain a combination of both virtual opportunities for kids and on-demand videos, as well as the in-person. So I think we're, by the time we, hopefully by the time we're into June, the beginning of June, when we have the kickoff, that messaging will just be a constant thing that we're still welcoming people who, whatever interaction they wanna have with the library. Awesome, that sounds great. Okay, there you go. So how is everybody else tackling that? Um, I know that things are changing at the end of the month. Um, since we're all one way. 
Um, has that been a struggle with welcoming people back and kind of um, like towing the line of, of messaging and everything? I can say at our library, um, we just got done with Harry Potter book week. Um, we changed the night into a week and the staff focused on having um, activities within the youth services departments that weren't per se programs, but we did our display window is like a big seek and find where you, you have a, a list that you're looking in the window for all these things. We had a, a scavenger hunt where things were, were hidden all over the library. Um, and it went over really, really well. We got our door count went up for the whole week um, because they were at least activities that people could come in, but we spread them out throughout the, the department. So they weren't right next to each other. Um, and, and they weren't in for a long time, but people loved it. So we're trying to focus on some things like that for, for summer reading too, where we're gonna have activities spread out. We don't know where we'll be as far as programming by then, so. I love that seek and find idea. I think that's really sweet. Like a little I spy in person kind of thing. Yeah, and the, the adult department's been doing it too. They had, uh, I think it was a, a horror movie month or something where, they had things in the window and you had to guess which horror movie it, it connected with, you know, like a ski mask and whatever. Um, so people love it. Oh, that sounds amazing. We've actually been talking about a scavenger hunt based um, sort of effort for probably for next summer, but we might do a little trial run with staff this, this summer. Is, is anybody else doing that? I feel like we've talked about sort of a, a a multi-organization scavenger hunt recently, maybe at the last meeting. Um, and that sounded pretty exciting, but kind of a, a big effort too. I don't know if, I think maybe Huntley was part of that or I can't remember. That was, yeah, all of McHenry County. Okay. No, Huntley was on here too. I don't know where I think she's at, but um, 11 libraries in McHenry County, we did a library lovers expedition for this month. And so it's kind of similar. People are encouraged to go and visit all these libraries and some of the smaller libraries, um, you know, they're smaller, but one has a ski ball machine and a basketball hoop and some interesting things. So people have loved it. We have over 600 people registered and I don't know how many will finish the program, but again, they're going into the libraries, but they're not, it's not per se a program. They go in, they, they're by themselves at their own time, but, um, and there is a big prize at the end. There's some prize baskets, but really that doesn't seem to be driving people. It's just some people just seem to want to go visit other libraries. Mm -hmm. That is kind of a nice self-guided. Oh, there's, I at least see someone from Huntley there um, popping in. Um, oh, it looks like Beth at Jerseyville did a scavenger hunt in the library for Olympic programs or pictograms, excuse me. People had to look through all the library for the pictograms and try to guess what sport it represented. Oh, that's a lot of fun. I wonder if this is sort of a self-guided program trend that we're looking at that might be COVID related. That's kind of an interesting, um, it, it seems like it's popping up across these and it seems like the sort of tying um, theme is the self-guided. Apparently um, Beth from Jerseyville also says, apparently bingo is very popular around here. Um, we hadn't had a lot of people coming to events, but when we did library lovers bingo, we had 33 people. And that's the most we had in a while. Oh, bingo, so that's fun. And then Linda at Northbrook did an outdoor scavenger hunt around Northbrook as part of last year's summer reading kickoff. Linda, I might pick your, I just picked Linda's brain about her marketing department set up. So I might need to pick your brain about this because we're looking at it too. Um, and they're planning to do it again. People submitted their answers online and we gave away prizes. Oh, that's so fun. Um, then Doug says he's listening in. Um, oh, th thanks for joining us, Doug. That's totally fine. Um, for, for the kickoff, we've decided to focus on takeaway kits, you know, craft kits for all ages. We tried this last year for the rescheduled free comic book day. So we had hundreds of bags that gave away different tables. We had things out and kind of color coded by a little on the sticker. So we haven't worked out all the details yet, but we're hoping to have live music on the front porch as people come in and out come in grab your bag maybe get a book or two and leave you know with your 
having signed up for summer reading. So a little bit of a, a combination of both, not come and linger, but stop by, wave hi to him and go on. And, and we're hoping to get back to in-person for all ages in May is our current thinking, having to do with when um, vaccinations are available for the younger, the younger cohort. I know oh, we cross our yeah. fingers. Exactly. Yes, we've had some some emotional roller coasters in our household, at least with the differing timelines that have come out with that. But um, yeah, that's so. How are you guys dealing with this? Is something that came up for us re recently. Um, I'm assuming that's not registered when they're getting the kit because of the sort of nature of what you're doing. Are you? Are oh you yeah, it's a giveaway. Everyone will get one. I don't. We're not going to check and see if somebody has registered yet no the idea is come in we'll help you sign up we'll have our ipads we can help you in the lobby with that just you know at a distance if we need to um pick up your kit and go but we're not going to double check that people have actually signed up uh, we usually do a giveaway and sometimes there's a process of checking sign up first and then come to the table where the giveaway is whether it's a bag or a t-shirt or something fun mm -hmm. um but yeah so we're 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 encouraging in general sign up, sign up the parents, sign up the kids, like we all do uh, for summer. So, okay. Um, how do you guys? How are how are you doing your estimates for quantities and things like that? Just kind of going over and and give out the rest later if they don't go. I think that's where we're at, and and we've had such um, we've had we've had to keep increasing our weekly giveaways for crafts. So we're up to more than 300 a week at the main library wow. on a Thursday. We're giving away to teens, to, you know, to all ages. So yeah, we're giving away hundreds of kits every week. Um, those same people are probably gonna show up for summer, summer reading kickoff. And if they don't all, we don't give them all the way on Sunday, we'll have them out at the children's desk, et cetera. So I don't have to worry about quantities except for the, the kickoff giveaway. Um, I'm not really sure exactly how my colleagues are doing it. I think they're taking like a couple of years ago, cutting it down a little bit, padding it, you know, the usual. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, Cindy from Cole City said, uh, we did a scavenger hunt for Take Your Child to the Library Day. The kids made gold medal crafts and we did a photo booth. We tied it into the Olympics. Oh, that's so fun. That sounds really great. How did it go over, Cindy? If you're, uh, I don't know if you're chat only right now, that's totally fine. No, I'm here actually. Um, it went over really well and families came in and kids loved it and had fun running all over the library trying to find the scavenger items. So it was a great deal. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, that's great. What else is everybody up to? I can second the uh, take it, make it kits kind of being the saving grace at this point. Um, we've been doing them since basically since we reopened and we reopened in the summer of 2020. So um, our like last year, I think we gave out almost 9000 kits because we would just have them every single day. And uh, we learned a little bit from it. Um, we would originally put them on our events calendar to entice people to come in, but the demand got so overwhelming that we actually stopped promoting them. And we just kind of always have them. And then people weren't coming in being like, well, I wanted the Pikachu craft and you're out of them. And, you know, so now it's just like, this is what we have on hand. And um, it's been so successful with the children's department that actually now our teens are doing monthly ones. Um, every month, the uh, uh, teens can come pick up, take and make it craft kits. And then we're even um, trying them out with adults too. And they're seeming to be very uh, popular there. But in our community, like arts and crafts is like, if we could literally just be a free art studio, I think they'd love that. So um, they're big here. So it's been really successful in getting people through the door and and getting our circulation numbers up because kind of once you're here, you start looking around and, you know, take some books home too. Yeah, that's a good point. I love this as a strategy to bring people in and uh, not sneakily, but just give them another reason to kind of come in and see what's going on and remind them that we're here and kind of give that incentive. That's a really good idea. Hi, I'm from Huntley Area Public Library. We're also doing a scavenger hunt around our library for teens, adults, and then we also have a children's one. So the children's one, we have little characters posted around our library so that the kids can see all the different areas, not just the children's library. And then for the teens, we specifically kind of kept it in the adult teens area 
and um, spotlighting our new rooms and areas that we have. So it's been really successful. We've had a lot of kids running around. They're having fun looking for the characters. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. So are you tracking um, participation at all or how are you guys running it? Yes, we're um, tracking the participations. Um, for the teens and adults, we're having them at the end of their scavenger hunt, scan and fax um, their finished sheet to our information desk. And then for the kids, they return their um, little sheets of paper with the characters on it. So we are counting them after, it's a month long program. So it's gonna be done February 28th, so. Oh, that's great. Is anybody else doing sort of self-guided programming? That seems to be the, a, a good mode for welcoming people back right now or anything, don't let me stop you from sharing anything. <clears throat> um, Coal City is collaborating with 10 other libraries for the month of April, and we're gonna do a library road trip where we're encouraging people to visit all 11 of the libraries that are participating and they get a stamp at each of the libraries and each library has a gift basket as incentive for them to finish it and then there's going to be a drawing for everyone who completed all 11 libraries that's really exciting these are those are big projects to take on with coordinating between the different libraries who is is there somebody are you guys spearheading that in cool city or how did that how did those projects sort of um arise uh, no, thankfully we are not, but um, Lauren Offerman with uh, Three Rivers, she's very um, creative and talented and she's kind of spearheaded the um, project and so it's our first time doing it. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah, we'd love to hear how it goes for you guys, especially because it Huntley did something, Huntley and um, um, I'm sorry, did it was it McHenry County that said that they had done it as a whole? Um, that's, yes. that's really cool. Yes. And it's so funny because there's sort of this, um, I feel, feel like smallish group of people, like definitely parents who, who go to different libraries to kind of experience what they have for kids or the way that you would go to different parks in, in a community or something like that. So it's kind of an interesting approach that ties that in sort of the the tourism piece of visiting libraries. I don't know that that's sort of a um, I, I don't want to say natural inclination, but I don't feel like people think to do that. So encouraging that is really lovely. Yeah, we're well, partnering uh, with um, Crystal Lake, Algonquin, all the McHenry County. And we actually had uh, John's Birds um, stuffed sloth come into the library and took some pictures with our staff and around the library. And then we also had Crystal Lake's giraffe from the children's department come to our library and do the same thing. So the stuffed animals or um, characters are collecting the buttons and showing it off on their social media so that we can connect with each other on social media. Oh, that's really exciting. I'm, I'm curious if anybody else in this group is promoting the Madeline Miller event because 31 Illinois libraries are co-presenting that event on March 3rd. Nobody else in this group. <laughs> yeah, sorry. This is Amber from Skokie Public Library, and we've been sharing mostly on well, all social media channels. Um, usually closer to the date because I've learned that people don't, you know, like to plan that far ahead. But yeah, we will be most likely next week and the week after that. It'd be it would be exciting to get the numbers up on that. I think like around 500 people have signed up so far, but there's spots for 5,000. So yeah, it's it's going over well. People really like her. Um, and her book, Circe and, and Song of Achilles. So, and it's also, it's free and open to anyone. So any, anyone who they, you know, that other libraries are welcome to sign up too. So this is Mandy from Lake Forest Library. We did an e-blast early on because we had several author talks um, from various things. And we had a good bump doing a very focused author talk e-blast to our residents and then since then have been promoting it in our traditional ways as well but that seemed to help but we do uh re-promote closer too because i agree with that that a lot of people aren't planning always too far ahead i 
Absolutely. It, it, um, it looks like Beth had said, I have not heard about this. Where would I see that? And I think is the Illinois Libraries Present from Amber the link for that? Yes. Thank you, Amber. Um, and then Lisa said that they're doing it as well and they're promoting her. Um, and it looks like it looks like Doug said, when we reopened after construction, we offered visitors a pop socket with our icon logo as a gift to the community for not only voting yes for our expansion, but to also say thank you for being patient while everything was under construction. It was very popular. Oh, awesome, Beth, that you're getting tied into it then. So you can do some promotion. I'm not familiar with it either. I'm clicking into it. Okay. Anybody else want to share? Anything? Share that you know we we try different experiments. I could just share one more thing about that event. Where you are. Um, we're doing, we're running a very, not a very expensive ad on Facebook promoting Madeline Miller and it's done really well, like, and like a promotion over time, over more than a month's worth of time. Um, just, you know, Facebook, there's exposure sort of over time. And so it's reached more than 10,000 people that way. Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think that that those things kind of fall flat, but I think it's really working in this case. And we've got quite a bit of click throughs from that. I am not sure who was talking, but it because it looks like everyone's muted right now, but um, it was pretty spotty from sort of the middle to the end and I wasn't sure. Um, Shandy says it's more than 33 libraries for Illinois Libraries Present. Um, I can't speak to that. Shandy, do you wanna jump in and talk a little bit about it? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but I had counted up just the ones that were participating in the Illinois Heartland region. And I think it was 40 something in the Illinois Heartland region. Um, and I think it was twice that in the Northern area. So, I mean, I think it was over a hundred. It, it was, it's a really large number. They've had two events so far. Um, one of them was just a couple of nights ago. They bring in really big speakers. So uh, it's membership based. So the first membership period uh, closed on December 31st, uh, but the pilot runs through July and then they're taking a couple of months off. And then um, assuming the program continues, which it's been really successful so far. So I think it'll, I presume it'll keep happening. Um, at some point they'll open up uh, membership again and it is extremely affordable, which is the point of doing this, you know, bring all these libraries together to, um, collaborate to bring in these big virtual speakers. And there's a neat opportunity here too, because while they're online events, they could be hybrid events too. So if we wanted to, you know, have people in the library for a watch party, that's a neat way to give people an opportunity. Oh, you can go see it. Oh, you can, here's the link. You can see it at home or come join us for this watch party. So that might be, that might be a, really cool opportunity to bring people back in the building. Yeah, that sounds really exciting. I was just clicking through the participants here and it, it is a pretty big list. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Does anyone know if there are like pre-made promotional materials for the event? Because I was for, informed like the other day that we were part of this and nobody told me anything so yeah before I recreate something like yes. I don't even know if our programmers have gotten information and haven't passed it on yet 
Yeah, so I'm on the marketing committee, so you're talking to the right person. So there is an email that goes out each week and um, to the library staff. So someone at your library is getting that email. So we'll just need to get you on that email too. So I would ask the director, whoever actually signed up for it. But yeah, there is a whole um, uh, folder of materials that are made. So a flyer, social media graphics, uh, just different things. And uh, we're trying not to share those links publicly. So she just shared that link. So it's fine. Just please, you know, keep it to yourself um, because the access links are in there too, and it should just be for members. But uh, it it's gonna grow too. So right now, like there's one flyer, like one social media graphic. Uh, but as like more templates are made, stuff there will be more to do. There's also a press release. Um, the press release can be cut down and just be a news brief, but I'd kind of like to have something that's quick and short that can and pre-made that can art just be popped in emails. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. So definitely explore. Thank you. Thanks, Shandy. That's really exciting. Um, Anybody else want to share? I'll share some things that we're doing in the Algonquin uh, Public Library. So uh, we're doing a kind of a whole sci-fi month. We dubbed Library 2121. Uh, I know I mentioned this once before in the last meeting, but it's, it was our 100th birthday. So to end our 100th birthday, we're looking 100 years in the future to the year 2121, uh, hence Library 2121. So I built this page I'll share with you guys on our website. And try to get my programmers to think that how we can package programming and try to move multiple pieces of services. So uh, everyone came up with sci-fi programming, which was great. Uh, one librarian did their own take on uh, HAL from uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. She called them RAL. Uh, so it's just a catalog game. So I guess that could be like our self-guided programming. Uh, so people can play that ironically. A uh, curiosity stream just happened on uh, Hoopla with the binge pass, which I imagine almost all of us, if not, probably have Hoopla. So uh, curiosity stream has a lot of great sci-fi space themed uh, things happening. So tie that into it. And then of course, ask the librarians to make uh, record sets of sci-fi themed books to try and move the collection with all the programming. And then the cool, all the decor is going to be, we have tons of backdrops. We built our own little Stargate uh, so people can come take a backdrop photo with that and post it on social media. And then uh, I'll be dressing up this Tuesday for Tuesday, T-W-O, uh, this is two, 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 two. And yeah, so we're doing like little goodie bags. It's kind of like our final hurrah to everything because we were supposed to have a big gala, but that got canceled because COVID. So this is kind of what it flourished to be. And we'll be dressing up as sci-fi people and giving away ice cream sandwiches, uh, freeze-dried ice cream sandwiches. So that is our cool thing. But I tried to sit here and think, uh, how can we make the table a little bit more fun and engaging? So I'm going to share something I found. Um, I used to use this at my old job, which I ran an escape room uh, for quite a few years. And this is a, uh, I shared it in the chat. It's a social media counter. Uh, maybe some of you have come across this, but essentially it's something live and interactive that people can do to like our Facebook page. So I have it set up. You have to, you know, power it and uh, link it to your um, Wi-Fi. But when someone comes up and I could be like, you know, I'll be Robot Ryan. And I'll ask him to like our Facebook page. And then it'll do this little flippy thing, kind of like an old train station. Um, and it'll show in live update that they they like our page. So it's kind of a little something fun, interactive. If you guys do a lot of like outreach out there and you have access to something, you can plug that in and Wi Fi. Um, it just, it's interactive. So try to get those likes up on your pages. That's really cool. That makes me like want to like temporarily unlike a page just to like the page again. <laughs> and that's true. If people unlike it, it will also go down. Um, I had it up for the month. Uh, that I displayed it. So um, it's got 33 like cents, which I, I think I can't say that's directly because of it, but I mean, that's pretty 
pretty good for us. Yeah, that's an interesting way to kind of tie the digital into the real world experience. It's kind of fun that the web page that you made for um, the 2020, 2121, um, this is lovely. I, I that's really exciting. I love the freeze dried ice cream sandwiches. I think that that's fun. Um, Beth says so awesome. And she's going to look into that counter thing. I don't totally understand it yet, but I'll read more about it. Later. <laughs> it's, it's a little pricey, but you know, it's something interactive. It's mm -hmm. you know, Do you remember what it was from France, uh, like 360 ish. Um, but I mean, it's something permanent they can hang on your wall and whoever lived there it does its thing. Oh, and then somebody shared the Madeline Miller link in the chat. So if anybody was looking for that, I know a couple of people um, weren't familiar with that or not weren't familiar, but um, hadn't seen it yet. Um, so yeah, if I, does anybody have anything else they wanna share? I, we can always end early if we're just kind of crickets. Or Tamara, oh, yeah. is there anything we should cover here? I can share no. that uh, we have our um, chicken program coming up. I don't know if any of you else do it. I know several libraries, you know, get the chicken eggs, um, the embryology program. Um, we work with our local 4-H, so they just loan us the incubators. But if you want to get people into the library, that's a great way to do it because people love coming in, adults, kids alike. We didn't get to do it last year. This year, we're going to set it up um, we're going to put the incubator and eventually the chickens in their own and the program room and people can register um, for 10 minute visit visits. So again, that helps with the social distancing. And then we're going to make an interactive website to a web page where hopefully we'll be live streaming the eggs and the, and the chickens once they're born. And then people that are maybe not comfortable coming into the library can still do some activities. Um, but um, it's a lot of fun. We did, we've, we've done it once before, it's a couple of years back and we had a great time, so. That is so much fun. I, we have not done that at our library, but I, um, growing up, we did it in my, my classroom. Um, and it is what, like a core memory, I think. And I think that's yeah. really impressionable for a lot of people. Um, I love the live stream idea, kind of speaking to what Shandy had said with opportunities for hybrid programming. I love giving everybody the chance. And then the 10 minute slots are a really good idea too. Um, that sounds well, and it's great to work with the 4-H um, group because they're part of the University of Illinois Extension. So like I said, they, they loan us the incubator. We don't even have to buy it. And then we buy the eggs, which are really cheap through them. So they, they handle all the ordering and the delivery and they work with a lot of schools in the area. Um, and then like when we did it for the first time, when we had questions, they one of them would run over and just help us out and tell us what to do You know, when they started hatching and stuff. So it was great. Yeah, oh, that sounds great, yeah. Is anybody else experimenting with sort of a hybrid model for programming? We have, we have not dove into that yet at our, we've been doing meetings that were internal um, hybrid, but um, nothing where we're offering both for patrons. Um, we've been doing it here at the Lake Forest Library. Uh, there was some rough transitions and we just had to get uh, equipment that worked for us. Um, I haven't gotten much feedback on the experiences for patrons. And a lot of times I've noticed um, most people are still choosing online. So in our registration for sign up, we so we get an idea for numbers. We're asking them to let us know if we're going to come in person or participate online so that we're prepared. Um, but we're still continuing it to do it. So I'm hoping it's going well for the librarians as far as right now, but I think people are appreciating the offer. Has anybody had any difficulties with communicating that where you're offering both and avoiding any confusion? We did a program like that and we, on Communico, they were able to sign up for either the virtual the zoom portion so it it was pretty straightforward um but uh 
same thing here, kind of people like the option, but then they ended up choosing virtual. And some of our programs that were previously in person, I think will continue to remain virtual probably forever, just because they're doing so much better. Some of the movie discussions where people can watch the film on Canopy or Hoopla and then have the virtual discussion versus coming into the auditorium and watching a movie together. And just in general, I would say our in-person programs that we've been running in the auditorium, again, there was a, a big demand in the community. People wanted the in-person programs, but then we're not really seeing that bearing out and people actually attending the in-person programs. So we haven't, even though we're down to like 50% capacity for the space, we're not seeing signups nearly even hitting that upper threshold, which is interesting. Absolutely, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Amber says, have folks done a survey on what programs people want? We did an email survey in December and most adults were only wanting online. Of course, Omicron was happening at the time. Um, we have not reached out directly. I think for, for us in, in our library, our programming staff is just um, a little bit in a coping phase and <laughs> doing what they can. I don't know if other people are experiencing that as well still, but um, it, it's so reactionary for us um, based on how everything is, it changes so frequently and they're planning so far out. So um, Doug says we resumed in-person programs when we reopened earlier this month from drop-in crafts in our creation studio or creative studio, excuse me, book sales in our program rooms and story times have been packed. Oh, that's great. This is Mandy again. So where you were talking about Omicron, we did go, we had a, several hybrid programs and we transitioned them then to virtual, which, you know, was hard to manage because I think you get confusion that way. And then we, within a month's time now have gone back to allowing our hybrid and in-person again. So I agree with you. It's a lot of reactionary back and forth. It'd be pretty stressful and it's hard to communicate that out, right? Yeah, I think in our library, we've struggled with, um, sort of the change fatigue of, of communicate, not personally, but but worrying about that for patrons where we're, we're worried that the changes are not getting through because there's been so many and there's been sort of incremental changes over time where um, it can be sometimes more confusing where we're like, well, you could wear a mask, but you don't have to, but, but maybe we encourage it. Um, and I know that that was just mentioned on the Facebook page, I think, um, somebody had asked what the, they're doing about messaging. So um, definitely hop in on that chat too, if anybody has any insight. I think I think I saw Emily Glimco had, had shared um, some, some wording they were using that would seemed helpful to me. Um, Linda says, we've been doing a monthly survey for the last three months and in our latest results from last week, patrons were split about 50-50 in terms of wanting virtual versus in-person. And Linda, you were the one that had said it, it wasn't bearing out in reality, right? That that they were saying 50-50 online. And that right. It, yeah. In fact, and we've been having the mask discussion as well. And I feel like that may be the same case that we're getting a lot of very vocal people saying they want mask optional. That's probably the way it's going to go. But I wonder if people are still going to continue to wear a mask anyway. It's kind of like those people that are so upset about it may not be the people that are actually coming into the library. They just want to know that it is optional. Kind of like when we first reopened after we were closed for a short time and we didn't see the deluge of people coming into the library like we expected with how vocal people were about wanting to come back into the library. So hoping that'll be the case, but we'll see. And I did, I think the, that you mentioned Emily's response on Facebook and I thought that was really helpful too, to see. Yeah, I did too. I wonder, I, I doubt I'll be able to bring it up in a, in a convenient amount of time here, but um, I, I think what she had mentioned, and, and Emily's not in today, um, I think she had staff training as well as Andrea, um, but I think what she had sort of emphasized was letting patrons know where you stand rather, rather than just saying mask optional. I think it was a mask encouraged kind of statement that she had written, but um, hop on the Facebook page, the ILA Marketing Group Facebook page to see what she actually wrote. Um, Cause I, I was gonna seal it for our library, I think after we run it through the managers. Um, 
So just sharing in case that's helpful for anybody else. Um, okay, well, if, if anybody else has anything they wanna jump in and talk about, um, otherwise I think we could wrap up. Um, Tamara, is there anything that we need to share for the next meeting or? Um, two quick um, housekeeping items. Um, if you haven't already, um, we know that people get sick of registering for things. Um, we do have a monthly link that we send out to everyone so that you can bypass the registration. I'm going to put my email in the chat. And if you'd like to sign up to be included on that list, just shoot me an email and say, please add, add me to the marketing forum roundtable list and I'll take care of that. You will receive the link. Um, uh, before registration officially opens um, and you won't have to worry about registering um, and that'll happen every time we have a round table and they're monthly. Um, also save the date of uh, Friday, April 29th. Um, we are going to host this year's, um, the marketing forum is going to host this year's uh, mini marketing conference. Um, the theme or topic is uh, crisis communication. Um, we are looking to open registration very, very soon, uh, but right now I'm gonna be working on posting the save the date in the Facebook group. Uh, more information again will be coming very soon as registration opens. The two speakers are incredible and we're very excited to offer that. Um, and uh, please uh, feel free to um, register. Registration is still open for ILA's. Um, first annual forum open house, um, you'll have the opportunity to learn about all the forums um, and as well as the ILA marketing forum. We're going to have um, the a member and the manager, I, ILA marketing forum manager, Andrea Lublink, and she's going to be joined by uh, the marketing forum, a uh, marketing forum member, Karen McBride, who was last year's forum manager. Um, it's going to be great. Um, so please, please, please um, consider um, registering for that. That is um, this coming Friday, February 25th. So, um, and again, it's going to be like an open house. So it's from noon to two, but you don't have to stay the entire time. You can pop in and out. There'll be rooms for each forum. So you can, you know, spend one time in one room for about 15, 20 minutes, then go on over to another for another 10 minutes. It's up to you. You can do whatever you want um, as far as visiting with the various forums. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great weekend.